fantastic uh, presentations. Uh, the first one, I, I'm not, you, we've heard the, 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 the uh, details. I'm just going to tell you the reflections and the take-home the take messages. So uh, from uh, Dr. Mohammed Atom, very inspiration uh, 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 presentation on first uh, identifying a gap in knowledge and then taking the trouble and taking the initiative to think in a very uh, pragmatic way the ABCs of uh, treating kidney disease and, and the ABCs of uh, um, reaching, uh, teaching people how to manage the fluid need of kidney disease because kidney disease is very, the fluid need, the balance is very important and a lot of people die if the balance is not get, uh, was not get, uh, got right. So, and then sharing with us the journey and the pain during the journey and the successes and the levers which helped you in achieving and accomplishing the task. And then you asked uh, in the end very, very legitimate questions. Why colleagues in the South and in developing countries were not engaged? They didn't see the problem. And uh, you, all, all the help you got uh, from really enthusiastic people who are very uh, a, 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 um, really enthusiastic about uh, knowledge uh, sharing. So um, thank you for the inspiration and something for the thinking. And I should, I have to say this as a public health physician, uh, so how to prevent kidney disease from happening in the first place. Uh, the second and third presentation were around cancer. And cancer really is a horrible disease. They call it the big C. Uh, uh, um, Dr. Babiker talked about the initiatives of um, SMA and how they uh, developed uh, effective partnership in Sudan and how they looked at the uh, gaps in cancer treatment in Sudan and they came up with policy um, uh, um, relation and, and in, in terms of uh, also medical equipment, education and media and he assessed the three centers um, developed, he gave us an evaluation of the three treatment centers in Sudan. And he touched on uh, health education in, in, in relation to cancer, on, on early detection um, of cancer. Uh, and also he touched on the end of life care. So the whole pathway of cancer. But again, as a public health physician, what is the role in preventing cancer from happening in the first place? The honey uh, uh, presentation, uh, yeah, Russia was really, really sweet. Thank and you very really much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sweet and delicious. <laughs> Thank you. Sweet and delicious. I, 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 um, I followed it, uh, although I. I didn't understand some of the technical yeah, they, parts, but I, I followed it with fascination. So the question is, shall we then, uh, as women, have a, a spoon of honey every day, or or uh, uh, how, how can we, like yes. Professor Bagadi said, uh, uh, and it's really, really promising, and then how can we help? as a diaspora or Sudanese knowledge or was in helping you in uh, a, a, a resource uh, fund fundraising yes, yes. and in, in uh, forwarding the research further. So this is really a summary and a reflection um, of, of, of the presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Very uh, elaborate and very precise and very secretary. Uh, summary of what was given in the last three papers. Now I will ask you for questions. So many of them. <laughs> My question is to to transfer knowledge to him because he wants to do something in in Zamzam water, and I, I didn't know how to help him because I know people working with cancer they have a substance they extract a substance from the honey, and they say this is the active substance. We patent this, but now in the United States, for example, you cannot patent a natural thing. You cannot patent a gene. 
you cannot patent and extract from a plant or because this is something existing unless you make it or you uh, do go through drug discovery uh, or uh, molecular engineering and you make it. So my, my question is that you patent the honey, the honey itself, and you are going to, to treat by just giving the honey. Yeah. Uh, we, Actually, we can't read it from here very easily. Uh, you can so, so the patent was issued or filed? The, there's a difference between issuing and filing yeah. patent. Yes. Yeah. Because so it's issued. It didn't go through the European Patent Office, the PCT, the treaty. Did it go through that? and Or just from UK? Because when we started patenting, we went through UK, but we had to go to the treaty. I don't know, after Brexit, UK is different, but still, UK is part of the European Treaty. You have to go to the PCT, and uh, then the patent will be issued from there, but not from UK, from the European office. Anyhow, you, you patent the whole honey, so the honey is, you own the honey, or, the, or something extracted, active substance that kill cancer cells. Because that is the question, and how to deliver the cancer. If a cancer is discovered on the skin, and you put some acid, it will kill the cancer. But if the cancer is in the head of the pancreas, how you will reach it? The delivery is the problem with the cancer treatment. So, I hope you got my point. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, yes. Um, actually, um, I filed my uh, UK patent in 2006, and then after, you know, in UK, they just hold the, the application for one year, and then after one year, they start to search. So it took like five years until I've got the patent in uh, 2011. So here, it says that a method of producing heat soluble, water soluble component of the great, greater than, uh, um, 100 kilodalton from honey for treatment of breast cancer. So actually, the, the experiment that I showed, I showed before, is just characterized so, some of the, characterized some of the, the substance, how can I say it, sorry. Mm -hmm. So it just beating some of the characterized inside the honey. Mm -hmm. And this is the new, but you know, Treating with the honey and the cancer is not. I mean, it's not new, but the substance that soluble, uh, not he, uh, not affected by heat, not dissolved in ether, around 100 kilo dalton. This is what I painted. I hope that I answer your question. And I, I, I um, applied for one of the agencies, UK uh, agencies, to do this uh, for me. So I hope that I answer. Um, for, um, as you said that, yes, my my philosophy, maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but um, mashallah, all of you doctors, mashallah, professors, and I'm um, just still you know, limited knowledge, but my idea that, you know, all of us, we have the cancer cells, but our immune system, and please correct me if I'm wrong, our immune systems can have the ability to discover the cancer or abnormal cells, and then after that, get rid of it. I think, and maybe I'm wrong, for the cancer patients, the immune systems, for a reason, cannot identify the abnormal cells. So with the honey, I think there are two things. They're going to return back the immune system to its function, so they're going to <coughs> identify the, the cancers and get rid of it uh, naturally. The other thing, the honey, um, the honey actually has some rules in the free radicals of the cancer cells. So it's just returned back the cancer cells to the normal cells by you know, the free radicals. And therefore, you know, one of the problem that the cancer is never died. But with the honey, I think that the cancer cells or the honey affect on the free radicals and then return it back to the, reprogram it to the normal cells. And therefore, now they are dying. I think so.
Yeah. This is excellent. Your explanation is excellent. Thank you. I, I just would like to advise you yes. because if you think that is going through the immune system, this is perfect. Okay. Because that means the substance is not mm -hmm. killed directly the cancer cell. Okay. But the, the immune cells will, uh, the immune system will be revived back and then do the job. Yes. So, and, and since this active substance, you put it in vitro, uh, I think the next, you start with animal model for cancer mm -hmm. and see if this active substance will pass the acidity in the stomach or will be affected. And then you look for certain types of cells which are important in, 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 in killing cancer, like the T-reg cells, t regulatory the CD4 cells, which are misdirected during cancer, so they don't recognize the cancer. But the T regulatory cells, the T helper cells uh, of regulation, if you look at them in your animal models, so you will understand the cellular mechanisms of uh, the anti cancer effect. And then you will see this is very important in the animal model to see that this product will have an effect uh, on, on the animal models and will pass the acidity and the barriers. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is very simple. I'm one of those that normally jump out of the class um, when you're talking about science. So <laughs> science is not my thing. However, um, I'm quite interested in the issue of the uh, treatments for liver cancer. Um, mainly because I know a lot of people of my generation that seem to now become victim of that. So I'm talking more from a community perspective now. Is it possible to develop a one-page guidance on liver management within the community so that we could more or less translate it into the language that our community understands, like the Yoruba, the you know Swahili. And if that is possible, I would like to be involved in that. And then when you talk about the the only only treatment, um, I belong to a community that is quite big, um, the Nigerian community, African community. So it would be quite good if we could work with the professor on how we could get some women together. We hold events in House of Commons where we could bring the African women together, we could look at that, we could push this visibility and also assist you in the area of the funding aspect. We know African people are not too good when it comes to funding, but I know women are very passionate. No, but we need to be honest, you know, uh, they could raise 1.2, 1.3 million within the white community, but when it comes to our community, you hardly raise 200 pounds. But maybe if we bring the women together, especially on issue to do with public health and cancer, they will see reason why we need to all work collaboratively, like I said, to be able to help you in this uh, quest. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Can, can, I, can, I, can I comment on the issue of liver cancer? Okay. Especially from a community perspective. Yes. Liver cancer, as in other cancers, the majority of it are preventable. So those uh, guidelines, which we will address in the health, in the public health, in, in terms of uh, the collaboration, uh, is a, around uh, uh, alcohol, around diet, That's around the well. impact <laughs> of fatty liver, uh, um, exercise, and uh, this is 40% of health improvement, which we will cover later. So it's not rocket science. You don't need. Uh, cellular level uh, uh, it, at some stage, but for the majority of the population, for the 40%, actually, you no, know, for the 85% of the prevention, it is within our day, day practice and the environment. Thank you. Thank you. And we are just, just adding to what uh, Mayada right. said, but we will be happy to help in uh, drafting some sort of a leaflet from our organization with the help of Mayada and the public health uh, doctor and our team. And then we could translate it uh, in other languages. So, uh, People didn't have a chance in the very second. I've got the priority. <laughs> 
Hello panel, Bradley Haslop, thank you for your discussion. So I've got a question mainly for everyone in the room. This is quite an academic arena and there's a big conversation in the UK about research to practice. How are we actually going to implement all this stuff that everyone's researching and finding out? So I had a question for everyone on the panel, which was about all these ideas you're speaking of, all this research. What steps do you know you're going to take or what questions do you need to answer to know how you're actually going to implement these? Who do you need to talk to? What time frames are you looking at to get these things actually in practice on the ground? Thank you. For the patent regarding this question, you filed the patent in 2006. So, all, all you said 2006. Yeah. So, that means already 11 years passed. You got only seven years, and then the patent, everyone can use it. So, you have to hurry up. Inshallah. The problem that, you know, for this research, I'm funding myself. I'm not following any institute. Very exactly. So I'm the one who paid for this. I didn't uh, belong to any institute. It's just idea come to my, inshallah. But it's just idea come to my mind. And I just. Uh, first of all, thank our scientific people, doctors who to give us a, I have a question to Dr. Mayada. I am a honey user for more than 40, 40 years. I want to ask a question. Is in the literature you find the honey only for breast cancer or for other things? And the second question, it is a Sudanese honey of the Yemen honey of the European honey or which one? Yes. Well. <laughs> I am using Sudanese honey from Raja or from south of Gadarif. Only they bring it to me every year. For 45 years, I am using that every day. Even I am old, the doctor tells me, stop it. I said, no, I will not stop it. How do you use it? Huh? <laughs> Good. What is the dose? <laughs> the dose? When a spoon in the morning. Uh, so... Um, people on Facebook are very excited to see everyone talking about such important topics. We have comments such as congratulations, good work, and there's one comment that uh, needs to be highlighted and apparently now I can't find it, <laughs> of course, uh, but that's okay. So basically everyone is very happy to hear you speak and they're excited to see further contributions. <coughs> Okay. Adil <laughs> again. I think, uh, well, I heard Dr. Uh, you know, uh, Ismail speak about, you know, three centers of cancer in the Sudan and so on. To me, the thing is not the quantity, but uh, what sort of quality do they deliver? And uh, I believe from what I heard is that, you know, the quality is very low. And if you want, you know, this have another 10 of a Sudan with such low quality, what we will get is very low quality of uh, health care as well. So I have some worries about that. But my main question is, what is common, and because this is, you know, a conference for diaspora from all over the world, what is common between, you know, Sudan and other third world countries? Have you compared these things and do you have any lessons which other countries can actually learn from your experience, which they can make use of as well? Thank you. Right. Um, thank you, Dr. Adil. Uh, regarding the uh, radioisotope center in Khartoum, it is one of the first radioisotope centers in Africa. It started in 1967 and it was sponsored by the WHO. It was the top of the art when it was uh, opened at that time. And uh, I think over the years, when you don't have support from international agencies, especially you are dealing with radioisotopes and the radiation, etc., there and, and the political sanctions and the economical situation in the country. I mean, one of the main issues for this, the, 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 the big one, the big radio isotope center in Khartoum, which deals with about 80% of the cancer cases, the brain drain. They lost in four years about 200 staff, trained staff in, in that center. Some of them, they were sent to Europe to get trained and they go and cross to Gulf, 
They become diaspora. <laughs> and, and become diaspora. Some of them are sitting with us here. <laughs> so um, I think the people who are working in, in the Sudan <laughs> are working in the Sudan with the constraints of resources and the political situation and the political sanctions on Sudan. Compared even to UK, not to the neighboring countries, they are doing very great job. And that's the reason we go there to help them to deliver more, to help them to connect with what is going on here. Because this is the lacking thing. In Sudan, they don't have time even to go and search literature. You know, you've been to Sudan. Doctor there, they finish their uh, duty in the public sector. Then they go and have their uh, mid-day uh, uh, meal, and then they will come in the afternoon in their private clinics, and they will continue there until 2 a.m. in the morning. Good morning. And patients, they have to book in, for some doctors for months just to get booking, to, get, to, be, to, to be seen by these doctors. And I remember one of my friends, he's a nephrologist in the field of uh, Dr. Muhammad, and he is, he's leading a very high post there, and beside his own private clinic. And I told him that, um, why not to come to UK just to have a three months refresher course in your area, and then a lot of things going. He told me, I don't have time. <laughs> I don't have time. And also one of the things that I think I have presented this in the last uh, presentation, the patient doctors percent in Sudan is 0.2 percent compared to the national standard, which is about three to 1,000. And we are dealing and performing less than, I mean, countries like Djibouti, which they, I think they have had a, a, their first medical school after the year 2000. And we have got 12,000 doctors Sudanese in the Gulf countries. We have got uh, 4,000 doctors here in UK and, and Ireland. So what we are trying to do, we go back home. We try to help the people and we, we try to improve the standards. I, I would like just to ask like one comment, which is to follow into what is being said. I think Mr. Mohammed mentioned something very important. This organization primarily was founded to exactly let me talk from this side. So what you read is very important. When we found this was 1999, primarily to bridge the gap between the South and the North, scientists from Africa and developing countries and scientists in the developed countries. And I had a very famous speech in uh, Helsinki for the European Union. I can send you the documentation. I have given them three examples. One of them is called the American Journal of Agronomy, and the British Journal of International Relations and Politics, all the editorial board of the British Journal of Politics is British. And it doesn't make sense, because this is journal is about the British Journal of, uh, the British Journal of International Relations and Politics. If you go to the American Journal of Agronomy, all of them are American, which makes sense, because they are discussing agronomy. It's American. But when you come to the African Journal, uh, African Af Journal of in African Affairs, they are not African. So who discussed the African affairs by Oxford University? We will call it prestigious in German. I don't call it prestigious. I can't just call it prestigious because it's published by Oxford. Most of the editorial board are not African. That's exactly the point that I was mentioning. If you don't raise, I wrote it. if you don't stand up for your discipline for yourself, nobody's going, someone will have to fill the gap. If you are not filling the gap, and this is a boring, Dr. Hamas said, and I can tell you from real experience, 15 years. So that's why the organization received lots of, uh, actually we invited by the European Union and so on. So we keep saying to people, why the, and also another example, the Journal of Asian Affairs by Routledge. It's not about, all the editorial board are not from Asian continent, one of two. Even when the one they come to you from Africa will be, uh, I'd like to welcome Professor Abdul Ghadir, just arrived. Abdelkader is one who campaigned for all this about bringing the gap, running all this uh, Mediterranean for North Africa. But just to come to the point, Dr. Mohammed mentioned, is a very important point. I don't know why, don't even ask me even over lunch, but this is a fact. The most, every year we give an award by Emerald, 
for the best reviewer of the journals. Emerald is one of the big publishers. Every year we give award for the best editorial board member. Although we are encouraging and we are primarily to help developing countries. I sometimes try to be biased to give it to someone from developing countries. I struggle. Most of the time it goes to people from the United States, Professor Beverly Anderson. Sometimes, one time it goes to Professor Roland McQuaid from Edinburgh. One time it went to this Adil. I call him British now or European. <laughs> not, uh, why? Because uh, the justification of the award, so he can put it in his office, he has worked very hard to build his review papers. We send asking people, African, Asian, Latin American, we don't get an answer. Reminder goes, and I can tell you another thing, which is very, very frustrating. You get someone being sent a paper to review, and then you get the second notice, the third notice, and then finally he will get a notice from us saying, thank you very much, we have to give it to another one. Then he will come back, oh, sorry, I just now realized I didn't receive this paper. But we send it to you three times. So really, this is a fundamental issue we need to address. We are not going to move forward. It's not about what we're doing here. We need to get people from the developing countries, from the countries where we come from, to come to stand up and help. Otherwise, it will not, will not work. What he said, Dr. Muhammad, is true. He said he tried to get a review for the book, primarily being, uh, if you like, written and, uh, and edited to help people in developing countries. He only got reviews from people here in Europe or in the UK and in, in America. That's a big question, and this has been a very serious issue. We really, I hope you can spread this word out and try to come with something we don't know, we have failed. The people who, I don't want to use the word, we sat them from the editorial board, but we have to, to send them a nice letter saying, thank you very much for your service for the last three years. Although they didn't serve us, but we say that nice word. Most of them, they were from developing countries. Although we are primarily focusing on bias to the developing countries. And I think that's a fundamental issue we really need to address. Why is happening? I don't know. And this is actually an issue being raised continuously. I'm going to hand over to the chair because I'm still way, I'm under the chair now. But uh, if, if I can just conquer what uh, Patricia said, try to make the lunch as short as possible. Uh, although we have half an hour downstairs. But I'm going to encourage you, please, try to have your lunch with someone you haven't met in the morning or you haven't chatted over coffee. Try to mix. I really encourage you to mix. Particularly if you come with Alam, somebody come with you, try to avoid him over lunch. Sit with someone else. So he's back to the chair now.